So what's different about 2017 is if you have a good strategy, your odds of success are just really, really high. It doesn't matter who you are, white or black. And that was never the case before. You know, if you go back 50 years, it wasn't good enough just that you went to college. It just wasn't good enough. But now you can find places where you actually have an advantage, no matter who you are. You just have to look for them a little harder. You seem really... Oh, somebody's angry, not me. Um, so one of the reasons I wrote my book, uh, How to Fail at, all, at Almost Everything and Still Win Big, is what I'm talking about now. There are a lot of people who see discrimination as the reason that you know they, they can't get ahead or whatever. And there is real discrimination, and it does hold people back. But what's but what I'm suggesting in my book, Win Bigly, is that if you craft your strategy of life correctly, you have an actual strategy, that those those obstacles are easy to avoid. Meaning that you can find the Fortune five hundred company who, who really, really would be happy to hire a black, lesbian, whatever, deaf person. You know, I don't mean, I, I'm not making light of any of that, by the way. I'm just giving you an example that strategically we're in a, one situation where everyone could craft a strategy, a different strategy, but everyone could make a strategy that, that played to their strengths. That was never the case before. So Win Bigly is about creating systems to improve your odds. Uh, and not having goals. I'll tell you what a goal would be. A goal will be, I will get this one job in this one place. And then, holy crap, it turns out that the boss at that one place is a racist. And now you can't get that job. So your goal your goal is thwarted. That's one of the reasons, in, in simplified form, where I disagree about having goals. Here's a system. A system would look like this. Um, apply to several Fortune 500 companies and find out which one begs to have you on board. Right? Because <laughs> you can make that happen in 2017. You, you could have companies begging for you. You don't have to join that one company where the, ra the boss is a racist, and if you accidentally join that company, quit that freaking company. This all assumes you have an education, right? If you don't have an education, your options are, are far less. Yeah, ageism is, I don't know that ageism, that problem is hard to solve. That's, I, I think the the people of a certain age may end up doing a lot of work from home stuff. There may be a, some workarounds to that and, you know, gigs instead of jobs. If you don't like your job, tell your boss what job you want. I love that. Thank you. Did you if you didn't see that comment, the comment was, if you don't like your job, Tell your job, tell your boss what job you want. That's just about the finest advice you're ever going to hear. In each of my jobs, uh, yeah, this is Ken, Ken Moore telling you that. In each of my jobs, um, I did exactly that. I took the job as described, and then I immediately got about the, the work of redefining it. So it was both useful and, you know, and fit my, my skill set. If you're not doing that, if all you're doing is taking the job and telling people that's not in my job description, don't expect things to go well for you. <laughs> you know, you get hired because people think you're going to use your brains and, you know, you're, you're going to take some initiative and you're going to figure stuff out. They don't have to do all the thinking for you. Got your wife a better job last week with that. Absolutely. The, the number of times you can tell your boss, hey, this isn't exactly the job I want, but if you change it this way or, or let me do this other thing, um, I'll fit better. The number of times your boss will work with you is pretty good. You know, not every time, you know, maybe 60% of the time it works. But, you know, if you've got a boss who won't work with you like that, start looking for another job, right? You should have a strategy that says the moment you feel any kind of a ceiling, start looking for another job. That's what I did. So when I when I lost my job to racism at the bank, I quit immediately. <laughs> I, I didn't wait. 
I immediately put out my resume and said, oh, okay, there, there's now a ceiling on my personal growth within this specific company. Put out my resume the same day. Took another job. Things were looking good. They called me in and said, we've got a problem. There's not enough diversification in the company. We can't promote a white male, for, and we don't know how long that's going to last. Soon as I heard that, I started working on Dilbert. All right. The moment you hear there's a cap where you are, leave. Um, I grew up in a tiny, tiny town in upstate New York. There were 40 people in my graduating class. I think 40 people, my entire graduating class. Um, and, and then I went to college nearby my small town, also a small college. But the first thing I did upon graduating is I traded my car, this old beater car, for a, a one-way ticket to California because I was playing a system, not a goal. The system was the first thing I need to do while I'm still mobile, because I'm just out of college. I don't have a, I don't have a wife or a family. I didn't have a girlfriend, nothing to, to keep me there. I said, what's the most important thing I can do for my career right now? I got my education. What's the next most important thing I can do? Go to where the most opportunity is. So I, I went to California. All right. I said, where's, where's stuff happening? You know, where's there's growth? Where's there's technology? I'm not even saying real sentence. Where are there, where can I find growth and technology and, and energy and people and opportunity and all that? So I went and I lived right in the middle of it. And then I tried to figure out what I was doing, right? And from there I got a job as a bank teller and then I got on training programs and worked my way up until they told me it wouldn't work anymore. But in the process, um, I, I saw my, my careers as uh, education. So when I worked for the bank, I took every class they offered about everything from communication to listening to negotiating. These all fit under the persuasion theme. So you'll, you'll see that I've been developing this for decades. Um, <laughs> and I learned as much as I can in my day job because I never considered my day job my goal. The, I, I was playing a system, and the system was to use my day job to learn so much that I had more options, whether, or, whether that included other companies working for them or starting my own thing, which is what happened. So by the time I started Dilbert, I had this tremendous amount of background and training from my corporate life, which was exactly what I was doing. I would start. I would stop short of saying learn anything. So one of the comments here was to learn everything you can because you never know when it will be useful. I will modify that with, uh, that's almost exactly what I'm going to say, but there's one, one change to that that I think is critical. And the critical change is that you want to develop what I call a talent stack, which is a set of skills and knowledge that work well together. That's the key. So, for example, if you wanted to be a writer, it would help a lot to learn things like uh, communicating, listening, negotiating. They're, they're all very close. And then if you had that plus writing, you could do a lot of stuff. But if you're an engineer and you're taking classes on knitting, probably the knitting is just for fun. It doesn't work with your other skills. So be careful about what you learn if you're trying to do it for useful purposes. Yeah, typing was the most useful thing I learned. You probably read my book and you saw that. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, the reason I wrote Had It Failed Almost Everything and Still Win Big is to teach people how to create strategies and how to use systems over goals as just a better way to approach life, a way to keep you happy while you're doing it, but also make you more likely to succeed. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Writing good is good. <laughs> That's funny because of the way you wrote it, which is you wrote it good because you made me stop and look at it because you said writing good is good. Uh, 
because my brain said, hey, there shouldn't be two goods in that sentence so well, so close together. And then I realized that your topic was right and good. And then I realized it was actually a really, really good sentence. Yeah. Um, are stupid unteachables doomed to poverty? Um, I'll give you the complicated answer to that. I, it is clear that people who don't have a good education and are just not very smart are going to have a hard time building a, you know, a wealthy life. That's pretty difficult. But I think the age of robots and the future, our demographic future, especially with so many retired people, pretty much guarantees that two things are going to happen. One, three things kind of related. One is that the cost of health care has to go, has to be asymptotic with zero, meaning that it's going to have to go down a lot so that even poor people can have a good health care, uh, you know, a better system than we have now. Um, then I think we'll probably have energy that's close to free, communication that's close to free, uh, or at least the poor person's versions of them might be close to free. You know, that the high-end cell phone and the, the high-end internet connection might be premium things that rich people buy. But I think we, all we need to solve is housing and health care, getting the, the cost of them down so that a person with a low-end job can live a fantastic life. Because imagine if you had a, you know, a clean, nice place to live, doesn't have to be big, just, you know, it's good for you. Uh, you've got free health care and you've got a big screen TV and a, a laptop, you know, that now don't cost very much because of technology. You've got a s smartphone. You're in pretty good shape. You don't need a car. You probably use some Uber-like self-driving car. <laughs> well, I think the age of robots is probably going to overlap with the age of uh, the inexpensive life option. There will still be the people who live the expensive life, but there, there should be an inexpensive life option. It might be on, you know, God knows, it could be on off-seas barges, it could be on new cities that the robots build in the, in the deserts, but they're going to have to be low-cost options for living. What about rent? Well, that's the point. You make the, the housing so inexpensive that the rent is... $200 a month, and everybody can pay for it on Social Security. Any talent you think is grossly overrated? I say multitasking. Yeah, multitasking is uh, not real and never has been. Uh, the brain does not multitask. It can, it can packetize. In other words, it can think about this, then quickly think about this, and then quickly think about that. But it doesn't think about two things at the same time. That's not a thing. Um, so multitasking has always been uh, BS. <laughs> Warm the planet so housing is unnecessary. <laughs> interview tips. I'm a little rusty on the, the interview tips, uh, meaning I haven't done it in a long time. And every kind of interview is going to be different. But I'll, I'll tell you one, I'll tell you one, well, a couple of rules of interviews that you're not... You know, I, I guess these are just as close as you can get to a universally true thing. Your only thing you you need to do in an interview is convince the interviewer that you're you're going to add something to the situation. So if all you're doing is like, I have this skill, I did this, I did that, then you're kind of, you look like everybody else. If you come in with a bu bunch of BS and you say, I have come here to be the best employee who has ever worked at this company. I will make us a fortune. Well, it's a little too BS. But if you come in and say, look, this is my philosophy. All right. Uh, I'm going to help out even if it's not my job. I'm going to try to figure out what works and what doesn't. I'll be honest if you ask me what doesn't work. I promise I'll be honest about that. And if you ask me what is working, I'll be honest about that. So what I'm bringing you to this job is I'll, I promise that I'm not going to be stuck in my little box. You know, if there's something that needs to be done, I'm just, just going to do it. And you're not going to hear me say, that wasn't my job. You tell that to a boss, you went to the top of the list. Nobody disagrees. Watch this. Watch in the comments. You go into your boss, and you go in for an interview, and let's say your qualifications are at least as good as the other people. 
you go and say, here's the deal. All the people applying for this job, we all look pretty good on paper. I'm not going to think my job is limited to the hours or to the tasks. I'm here to give you what you need. I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest with you. I, w- I work well with coworkers. I'm not here to have fights. I'm here to get the stuff done because that's the only thing that makes me feel good. When I go home at night, I want to feel like I did something useful. All right? And if I come to work and I don't feel that what I'm doing is useful, I'm going to come talk to you. And we'll figure out how to make it useful. All right? Uh, beyond that, I'm pretty sure that I have all the capabilities to learn everything you need based on what I already know. All right? But I also think a lot of other people are going to bring that to the job. What I'm going to bring you is no problems. All right? I'll never be your problem, boss. I'll never be your problem. But quite often, I will be your solution. Yeah, if you need some other problem solved, come to me, right? I'll do my job and I'll help you as much as I can on the other stuff, right? And I'm never going to complain about that. You say that to a boss, you're hired, right? Bring, bring me, bring me the uh, African American job applicant who can't get a job and feels that racism is the problem. <laughs> 